I want you to take your Bible, turn to the book of Psalm. I'm going to do this. And uh, then I'm going to get out of your way. This is what I preached at a man's funeral yesterday. And uh, no, it's not because I don't have another sermon. I got, I got one. And I really, I really did think it was for today, but I don't know. I, I'm just one of those days where I'm not doing too well emotionally. It just came out of nowhere. Um, I can usually tell when it's coming. And uh, sometimes I can do something about it and sometimes I can't. But when I went to that funeral yesterday, I mean, I know how most people see preachers. And I know how most preachers are. I am one. I've been one. Long time. Uh, when I was in Bible college, I had a reputation in Bible college for being probably one of the most judgmental students they had. My, after my first year of Bible college, the school wanted to put a group of four guys, young men, going around the country. Somebody was going to fund it, and we were going to travel to churches all over the country and sing. It's going, uh, it going to be barbershop quartet style singing gospel hymns. And um, I, they were going to pay us. All of our expenses paid. I was going to get to see the country, going to be gone most of the summer. And I thought, shoot, I'm 19 years old. And I'm going to get paid to sing and go see the whole country. So I tried out and got it, got the lead part. And they liked, they handed me a pitch pipe. They wanted me to start out every song with a pitch pipe. And I, we did that a couple times in rehearsal. And I told the music director, I said, can we try something? He said, what? I said, I don't need this. He said, what? I put it down. I said, you guys ready? Let's sing this song. And I went, hmm. And I just gave out a hum. And we all started in. And he went, that'll work. So I got to do that but all around the country. But before we left, the dean of students calls me into the office. And he said, you guys are fixing to go on a long trip. You're going to be stuck together for about 11 weeks. And it's going to be, you know, probably you guys are going to, going to get on each other's nerves. He said, I'm just having a talk with all you guys, you know, just about your relationships and how you get along. And he said, I've, I've kind of noticed that you, you know, haven't got along with some people this year a few times. You want to talk about that? And he said, I'm talking to all the guys about it. And I said, OK. And we talked about it. And uh, we got when we got on the road, got on the trip. I brought that up. I said, y'all remember that talk that brother so-and-so had with you before we left about us getting along? And they said, do what? I said, he didn't talk to you about us getting along? And no, he didn't talk to us. And I went, oh. I was very judgmental. Very judgmental. And I'm not saying I'm not now. Everybody in here, we have a judgmental spirit and a judgmental attitude. We look down our noses at people. And don't say you don't. I'll call you a liar. Because we do. So I, I, wanted, I wanted these people... The most important thing to me is the gospel. And I wanted these people, I wanted these lost people to hear the gospel. So when I read this man's uh, little biography and I saw the similarities in us, I, I made sure to point them out. And I said, I think me and him probably would have been pretty good buddies. He liked to joke around, pick on people. I like to do that. And I said, told the audience, I said, I know, I know what a lot of people think about preachers. 
They think that we are judgmental. We look down our noses at everybody. And we think everybody is uh, going to bust hell wide open. And everybody's a sinner except for us. And I said, that's the reputation. I said, in some cases, we've done that to ourselves. I said, I understand that. And I said, because I don't know most of you, I only know Rhonda and her husband. And I said, I don't know Darren. I cannot be his judge today. And I won't be. I said, but... If you ask Rhonda, she'll tell you, I'm straight up. I won't, this is not the first time I've preached the funeral of somebody I didn't know. And I said, I'm telling you straight up, if I don't know for a fact they went to heaven, I cannot stand here and tell you they went to heaven. I must give an account. The Bible says that specifically, that I must give an account over the things that I've said to you people. I have to stand before God. You don't have that. You don't have that responsibility. Preachers do. It's written in the scriptures. We are going to give an account before God of every sermon we preached and everything that we said and did. And I said, I cannot stand here and tell you I know for a fact this man's in heaven. I'd like to, but I can't do it. I said, but let me tell you who's going to be his judge. It's not going to be me, and it's not going to be any of us. God is the judge. Turn your Bible to Psalm 7. You don't, I don't have the verses on the screen, so ha, 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 you have to open your Bible up. Psalm 7. Let's get a little, I like to get a little context. I don't like to just read one verse and leave it alone. I want to see what I'm talking about here. Psalm 7. Let's turn our Bibles there. Open it up. Let's start in verse 3. Oh Lord, my God, if I have done this. Oh, let's back up. Oh, we got to back up here. Psalm 7 verse 1. Oh Lord, my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it. Have you ever seen, a, you ever watched a lion tear apart something it was eaten? I mean, that's brutal. Rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver. O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in mine hands. Now you look at this. Here is a man that is number one judging himself if you let me just say this if you're somebody that worries about what everybody thinks about you if you will worry about you you won't have to worry what everybody else says and thinks about you judge yourself if I have done this, if, I have, if there be iniquity in mine hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. I've had to do that before. Let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust. Selah. Selah means think about that. That's a music pause. It means this... As the music fades away, you, pon you ponder that. Verse 6, Arise, O Lord, in thine anger, and lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and, and awake from me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. And verse uh, seven, eight, 8 is where I'm going. Verse 7, So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about for their sakes, therefore return thou on high. Now verse 8, The Lord, in fact, read this, read this, The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. Father, help me to preach this message in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Look at what he's saying here. The Lord. Who's the judge? The Lord. You don't want anybody judging you. 
You don't want anybody. I, and every now and then, I mean, stuff just stirs me up. We was at Walmart the other day. Young, young lady walked by. And I made it a point, once I saw the t-shirt she was wearing, I made it a point, I, I am not giving her the benefit of looking at her. Her t-shirt said, Save Trans Children. And as soon as I saw that, I pondered that. And I walked past her. And what I, I mean, I wanted to turn around and walk in front of her and say, I'd like to save children from trannies. Well, that's what I wanted to do. I'm glad I didn't. That's not my place. That ain't the place for it. The Lord shall judge the people. Who's going to judge that young lady for wearing that shirt? And taking that position that she's taken. God's going to judge her. Judge me, O oh Lord, according to my righteousness. And according to my integrity that is in me. Now, when you say that, you better be honest with God or God will open up. Listen to me. God will open up things in your life that you don't want opened up in front of everybody. I promise you, you don't. You don't want God spilling the beans, pulling the skeletons out of your closet and showing other people what you're really like. Not, not how you're like sitting here today. But what you're really like outside of this place. I gave him the illustration. I said, let's say a man 30 years ago killed his wife. Got sick of her, got tired of her, didn't want to divorce her, didn't want to pay the alimony, didn't want to, didn't want to go through all that. So he figured out a way, he killed her, took her way out in the middle of somewhere, buried her. Had his alibi all square and tight. The police can't prove he did it. They can't prove he didn't do it. Nobody, nothing. He later on, he'll, he marries. Lady just loves him to death. He's good to her. Good husband. Had children. He's good daddy to the children. Later on, they have grandchildren. He's grandpa of the year. Works his way up at work. Everybody thinks highly of him. He even joins a church. Is working in the church. And I ask the question, is that man still guilty of first degree murder? Does that ever go away? Now, I'm not saying, did he spit gum on the sidewalk? He killed his wife, got away with it. Is he still guilty of first degree murder? Did he not, did he not make victims of his wife's parents? I mean, we got a situation in Jefferson County right now. If you remember years ago, this gal come up missing. She's supposed to meet him at the, the horse show deal here in Hillsborough. And all of a sudden, she's gone. They're pretty sure the husband did it. They can't prove it. I don't know if the guy did it or not. That's not what I'm saying. The guy's guilty of murder. All of a sudden, 30 years later, cold case, cops stumble upon something. They find evidence. They find out where the body is. Dig her up, sure enough. Got evidence that he killed her. Because they found the bullet still in the brain area where her brain was. Matched it to a gun that he had. Boom. Got him. Should the judge, should the judge look back at the last 30 years of his life and say he was a good man? Well, in fact, we used to play golf every Wednesday. That, that judge should recuse himself. Another judge has to come in. He's a good man. He's done this. Should that ever come into play here? No, it's first degree murder in the state of Missouri. Do we not still have a death penalty? And it should be used. 
You see, that's what I, that's what I told everybody yesterday, and that's what I'm telling you today. And I don't know who's listening to this and don't care. Your sin, I don't care how little it was and how long ago it was. God still has it written down in his guilty book. And when you stand before God, he will pull this one out and say, you did this. And you tried to hide it and you covered it up and you and and you didn't confess it and you made everybody think that everything was okay with you but in fact well let's see let's look I'm looking down the list here I don't just see one here I see about 58 of them God judges turn to Psalm 9 not too far over that in fact all this came out of the book of Psalms it was real easy to preach this Psalm 9 Verse 7, But the Lord shall endure forever, and He hath prepared His throne for judgment. The very throne that God sits on is a throne of judgment. What is it, the Bible, what is it Paul said? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And if you think Judge Judy's mean... Psalm 19. Look at that. Look at how this starts. The fear of the Lord is clean. I won't say. I won't say that there are certain sins that I've never thought of. What I will say is, I know what the Lord would have done to me if I would have committed them. See, the fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord, it makes you live clean. Because you know God will judge you. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Does, and the question is, does God ever misjudge? There's people sitting in... In fact, this was funny because Steve, my brother-in-law, was there... And he, he was mad because he's going, I didn't do this. How many people in Jefferson County Jail sitting over there right now going, I didn't, I didn't do this. How many people sitting down at Bonterre going, I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Just most of them. Most people think they didn't do anything wrong. They, didn't, they don't deserve to be there. This and that and the other. And, and then, then, I, I, then I pulled out the analogy of, well, I believe my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. And I destroyed that with Ezekiel 33. You look that up, you'll find it. Your good deeds don't outweigh your bad deeds. The moment you do a bad deed, all your good deeds are gone. Quit playing games with God. But he said, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Turn to Psalm 50. Verse 6, the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. So you don't have to worry about me judging you. 
You don't have to worry about your mom and dad judging you. You don't have to worry about the people who don't like you judging you. You don't have to worry about anybody judging you. The only, the only person you have to worry about is God. He is the only one sitting on the judgment seat. The only one. Now, is God going to call witnesses in? Sure he will. The Bible says that their own conscience bearing witness. God's going to call your own conscience in to bear witness against you and ask your conscience, did he do this? And your conscience was going to say, yeah, I was there. I remember it. I'm a witness to it. I saw him do it. He's guilty. Psalm, um, Psalm 89. And believe it or not, I, I got two more verses, but I, I stopped that part of the message right here. And I think I'll do that today. After, I'm going to read, I am going to read one more verse. You, where did I tell you to go? Psalm 89? Hang on there. Psalm 98, 9 says, Before the Lord, for He come... Uh, for, for the Lord, He cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall He judge the world and the people with equity. Outside of every courthouse in America, there is a statue of a woman with a blindfold on, holding a set of... Um, Scale, thank you. Scales. The blindfold is supposed to mean that the judgment that they give in that room does not see the faces of men. Therefore, it does not fear the faces of men. It doesn't worry if you're black, white, yellow, immigrant, non-immigrant. It doesn't matter if you are rich or poor. It does, it's, not, it's not supposed to matter. Maybe sometimes it really doesn't. Maybe. But that's how it's supposed to be. And then the scales shows us that there must always be equity. If you have taken a life... This is according... God gave this before He gave Moses the law in Genesis 9... If a man sheds another man's blood, his blood shall be shed. That's equity. If you kill another man, an innocent man, your blood must also be shed so that both now the scales are equal. God, when Moses wrote the law and God gave Moses the law, he gave him laws about if somebody steals something or somebody damages something that belongs to you, he, he shall make payment, he shall get recompense, he shall do it. The scales have to be equal. If, if you did something, burnt down a man's field, and that was his whole livelihood for the year, and you offered him three dollars, is that equal? That man's going to starve to death. His family's going to starve to death. There must be equity. And let me tell you something about my God. He judges with equity. First of all, He does not care who you are. He does not care what family line you come from. He does not care what color you come from. He does not care what position you hold. He does not care how much money you have in the bank. He does not care two cents about that stuff. God judges with equity. And, is, and God is not afraid of the faces of men, nor does God accept your gift. In other words, God, did, did you not see how much I tithed last year? And God will say, no, I didn't look. So now... Psalm 89 verse 14 Justice and judgment are the, are, are the habitation of thy throne But Mercy and truth shall go before thy face Psalm 
There's a story I want to tell you, but I can't. So I'll tell you a different one. A few years ago, we had living next door to us a family, it's a man and his wife. She was she was never supposed to have a child. Never never the doctor told her she'll never have a child. And all of a sudden she came up pregnant. She gave birth to a little girl. Beautiful, pretty little girl. On her 13th birthday, her dad bought her a four-wheeler but did not buy her a helmet. So on her 13th birthday, she rode down the road and never came back. And I... At one point, not too long after that, I had to talk, try to talk her mother out of killing herself because that's how bad it was. And I've had to preach a lot of funerals. And that wasn't the hardest one I've done. It's about the fourth hardest one I've ever done. I preached that funeral and was coming back through Hillsboro. And I honestly, I honestly thought the speed limit was 55 through that little point. That's why I was doing 65. But it was a 35. So, yeah, whoops. So he wrote me the ticket, and I called the courthouse. It was Hillsboro, City Hillsboro, not Jefferson County. So City Hillsboro, and I called City Hillsboro, and I said, "Yeah, I'm calling to pay this ticket." And she pulled it up, and she said, "You can't pay this ticket. You have to come to court." Oh. I even tried to call in a, somebody that I thought could get me a favor. That didn't work either. I tried every way in the world to get out of that. There's a, there's a story in this and I want you to hear it. I dressed up. I'm sitting in the courtroom and God, the Holy Ghost is saying, Mike, I, I want you to watch because I have you here for a reason. So I'm looking at the judge and the Holy Ghost goes, Mike, do you know who that is? Yeah, that's, that's God. That's the judge. That's God. That's exactly right. And then there was a lady there. Judges say, next case. The lady would stand up with a manila folder in her hand. Mike, do you know who that is? I said, yeah, that's the devil. The accuser of the brethren. That's an angel. Mike, do you understand what's in that manila folder? Yep. Those are the books in the book of Revelation that are opened. Of every work of mankind. How, how many did I say? Every work of mankind. And God says, now do you understand why I have you here? I'm getting there. So they called my name and the accuser of the brethren stood up. The judge said, what is the charges? And she read off, I don't know what it was, doing a thousand in a 30 mile an hour zone, something like that. And um, I'm, standing in front, I'm standing in front of a judge. And I listen, I wasn't wearing no big 13 necklaces around my chest with my white no sleeve t-shirt on with my pants hanging down I wasn't dressed like that that was a judge I buttoned my coat up 
and showed that man respect. The judge said, how do you plead? Guilty, your honor. How else? What am I going to Am I going to lie? Oh, he should have checked his radar. I don't, I don't think there's, there's no way I was... All that stuff. They've heard that stuff all the time. Judge, I'm, I'm guilty. And then he asked me, is there anything you want to say before I pass sentence? And I told him the story. And he must have heard about that girl getting killed. Because it was such a tragic thing. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I'm going to write this down. I'm going to give you a one year suspension in sentence. The fine would have been outrageous. He said, I'm going to give you a one year suspension in sentence. Which means, and you listen. If you don't commit any, you don't get any more tickets. In one year, we'll take this out. We'll shred it. And it'll be as if you had never done it. And I was holding tears in. And he said, now you do have to pay the court costs. There's always an earthly price. Is there not? Have you not, are we not still paying that earthly price? Do you think I sped through Hillsboro ever again? And it's gone. You can look, you can dig all you want to. It's gone. Insurance company. Didn't find out about it? Nothing. It's gone. That's the kind of God that we have. He has mercy just as much as He has justice. He has mercy. And see, that judge, by right of the law, has a right to do that, doesn't he? He has a right to do that. He has a right to have mercy because he's a judge. I don't know, but maybe somebody here could use some mercy and not justice. Because God is judging. He's doing it now. To who? Uh, that's between you and God. But let us bow our heads for a moment. Let us bow our heads for a moment. And if there's anybody here between you and God, see, God will keep the first the first time. God will keep it private, just between you and Him. Now, if it has to go beyond that, then we have to bring in witnesses. But just between you and God. Will you confess the things that you've done? So that God's mercy will be equal to His judgment. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, God, for the multitude of mercy that you've given me. There's 
stories that I can tell and stories that I never will. The multitude of mercy that you have given me. That's why I serve you. That's why I do what I do. A lot of people have been good to me in my life. and Nobody has ever been that good to me. And I will serve you, Father, the rest of eternity for having mercy on me. And Father, for these, as they now confess their sins, you know, God, you know who's being honest. You know who's being truthful. You know who's playing games. And Father, for those who are true and right before you today, Father, would you have mercy instead of justice? Because you and you alone are the judge. As David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Father, you forgave him. He's in heaven. But the sword never did leave his house. And Father, help us to understand that while we yet come to you to find mercy and we find it, Father, there still is an earthly price that we'll pay. Swords that will never leave our house. Scars that we'll never get rid of. Father, remind us of all these as we go about our life this week. And Father, when we see the lady wearing the Trans Lives Matter shirt, when we see her, Help us, dear God, to have mercy and not justice. Because you died for her too. And it would be better if she were saved rather than for us to just make a big scene with her. But Father, help us, dear God, to be merciful people the way you are. And that have mercy on others and not judgment. Thank you God for helping us today. Thank you God for helping me today. I love you. And I love this church. And I pray God that you'd bless them today. We ask this Lord in Jesus name. And all of God's people said. Amen. I like them amens. Stand to your feet, please, if you would.